Hello and a very warm welcome to We on VOA co-production, our weekly special presentation on the latest developments in the United States in collaboration with Voice of America. I'm Akanksha Swaroop. The southern U.S. state of Georgia will, of course, play a pivotal role in the nation's politics when voters head to the polls in January to decide two U.S. Senate runoff races. VOA's congressional correspondent Catherine Gibson reports on the election that will determine the balance of power in the U.S. Congress for the next two years. President-elect Joe Biden still on the campaign trail. I need two senators from this state. I want to get something done. Supporting Senate Democratic candidates Reverend Raphael Warnock. Stand up in this defining moment in American history. And John Ossoff. The whole nation's eyes are on Georgia, y'all. Both men will need to defeat Republican Senators David Perdue and Kelly Loeffler so that Democrats can gain control of the Senate with the tie-breaking vote of Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. If they lose, Republicans will keep the majority and Biden will have much less political power on Capitol Hill. So they can't afford to lose any votes uh, from either, fa either caucus. Um, to, to, to push legislation forward. It's going to be a tough battle. Because the November elections failed to produce outright winners in Georgia, those runoff races have national attention. Georgia is going to determine, ultimately, the course of the Biden presidency. But the stakes are high on both sides. And I think God has put us in this position right now to stand up and tell the world what America's going to be for the next 50 to 100 years. The Republican candidates pledging they will be the firewall against a Democratic White House and House of Representatives. I know we're going to hold the line because no one wants the radical agenda of the left. Early voting is already underway ahead of Election Day on January 5th, 2021. Katherine Gibson, VOA News, Washington. Let's now find out more about why the state of Georgia has received so much national attention in the United States. And for that, let's quickly go across to Voice of America's Elizabeth Lee, who's joining us live from Los Angeles in California. Elizabeth, good to see you. How have you been? Good to see you. Good evening. Now, for almost 30 years, Georgia has voted for Republican presidential candidate. However, the demographics there are changing um, in this southern state. It is no longer a solid Republican state consisting of black and white voters only. There have been much migration over the years. So now you have Asians, Hispanics, uh, people from other parts of the country who are moving to Georgia because it, the cost of living is lower and they're there for jobs. It's become a battleground state and it has been a very close race between Joe Biden and President Donald Trump. Uh, Biden won by just over 12,000 votes. So this election is the first time a Democratic presidential candidate had won in Georgia since Bill Clinton in 1992. And since the November 2nd national vote, Trump has repeatedly claimed without credible evidence the vote um, in key battleground states such as Georgia was rigged. In Georgia, even after recounts, the number sh still showed Biden won. Trump has lost more than 50 lawsuits in battleground states contesting the vote. So earlier this week, the Electoral College formally gave Joe Biden the more than 270 electoral votes needed to certify his election victory. The U.S. practices an indirect form of democracy in its presidential election, so each state gets a certain number of electors based on the number of lawmakers who represent that state in Congress. Right. With a couple of exceptions, basically wh whichever president candidate gets the most popular votes in the state wins all the electors of that state. So Biden won with 306 electoral votes. Now that the Electoral College vote is completed, one last step happens on January 6th. The U.S. Senate and the House of Representatives will meet to officially count the Electoral College vote. So the attention is turning to the Senate races in Georgia. The outcome of the January runoff elections will affect the success or failure of the new White House's agenda. Kansha? Right. Elizabeth, on the Senate races in Georgia, who are the candidates and how would the outcome of the runoff elections impact the new administration and its policies? 
Yeah, the Senate races is in many ways a reflection of the tight presidential race right. in Georgia. There are two Senate seats in question. So re first, the Republican Senator David Perdue is up for re-election this year, and his opponent is a former documentary filmmaker, Democrat John Ossoff. The other seat, Republican Senator Kelly Loeffler, who was appointed by the state governor after the sitting senator retired due to health reasons. Her opponent is Democrat Raphael Warnock, who is a pastor. So under Georgia law, any election where no candidate receives more than 50 percent of the vote must go to a runoff. Both Republican candidates backed Trump's claims of voter fraud in the presidential election. So some Republicans are concerned the claims of voter fraud could discourage the president's supporters from turning out to vote. Although election day for the runoffs is January 5th, early voting started this week and Democrats have been trying to get people to vote. More than half of the ballots cast have been by mail, most right. likely because of the pandemic. Both President Trump and President-elect Biden have campaigned for the state candidates in Georgia. Um, what happens in Georgia is critical to the Biden administration because there are currently 50 Republicans and 48 Democrats in the Senate. If Democrats win both runoffs in Georgia, the party will have control right. of the Senate because Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, a Democrat, would break any ties making it much easier to advance the agenda of the president-elect Biden and Democrats. But if Republicans win one of those two seats, they will maintain control of the Senate. And right. Biden will face steep, steeper challenges in securing confirmation for his cabinet and will most likely have a tougher time pushing his agenda on issues such as climate change, immigration, infrastructure spending, and other priorities. And the top priority is the pandemic, which Biden says is a reason to vote for the Democratic candidates in Georgia. The two Republican candidates in the state are getting criticized for not doing enough to deliver more pandemic aid to many Americans who are struggling to survive. Now, the pandemic is taking a toll on people from all walks of life, and it has been especially difficult during the holiday season, and that too in the United States. Hunger relief organization Feeding America says more people are now seeking help at food banks across the United States. We bring you more with VOA's Maria Madiallo. Half a dozen eggs. Phyllis Marder quit her job as an Uber driver shortly after the coronavirus pandemic hit. Now she's struggling and says she's no longer embarrassed to go to food pantries to help her get by. And then I decided that that was just like keeping a secret makes things get worse. So and makes me feel worse about myself. And so I decided that it was more important to talk about it like, you know, I have to pay my electric bill and I have to go to the food pantry. There are many Americans like her. Feeding America, one of the largest anti-hunger organizations in the U.S., says the number of people seeking food assistance has increased an average of 60 percent since the pandemic began. Food banks and nonprofit groups are helping many survive. New Orleans resident Norman Butler is unemployed and says he and family would go hungry without this food aid. If it wasn't for the people being able to have you to come out to get some food to put on the table, we'd be worse off. We'll, no doubt, we'll, we'll, we will starve. Butler says he isn't fortunate enough to be able to telework like so many Americans during the pandemic. Because everybody can't work from home and everybody doesn't have careers where they can just operate on a computer and still have their income coming in. And as he puts a block of cheese in his refrigerator. This is what you call a blessing. Maria Magello, VOA News. What's the pandemic situation in the United States of America? For that, let's quickly go back to Elizabeth, who's joining us live from Los Angeles with more details. Um, Elizabeth, we speak on a day when the U.S. Vice President Mike Pence has just been vaccinated against coronavirus. Also, the holiday season comes at a time when some parts of the U.S. is seeing a surge in COVID cases. Where you are, Elizabeth, in Los Angeles is, of course, one of those places. What is the latest on the situation there and how have people been coping? 
So California is the epicenter of the surge in COVID cases across the U.S. California is the most populated state in the country. The recent number of new corona cases in California is ahead of entire countries, including India and Britain. Regions of California has been under lockdown again. And here in Los Angeles, this is the second week of a stay-at-home order because of a limited supply of intensive care unit beds at area hospitals. They're not just running out of beds quickly, but also, more importantly, there's a shortage of much needed staff to care for the sick. Local health officials say there will that will mean worse medical care across the board, not just for those with COVID-19, but also for people who are there for other reasons, such as heart attacks, car accidents. Now, some good news. The first doses of the Pfizer vaccine have arrived in California and around the country. Um, healthcare workers and those in nursing homes are the first to get the vaccine because there is a limited supply at the moment. Local health officials say the vaccine is coming, unfortunately, too late to prevent the latest surge from happening. Another piece of good news, a panel of independent experts have recommended a second vaccine by the company Moderna, and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration is expected to formally approve the Moderna vaccine later today for emergency use. Then on Sunday, the same panel of experts will decide which priority group should be next in line for that vaccine. Right. One proposal on the table are essential workers, such as teachers, bus drivers, restaurant workers, police officers, the people who are in close contact with other people. Uh, ultimately, each state here in the U.S. will decide which essential workers to prioritize. Now, both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines are very similar, the same type of messenger RNA hmm. vaccines. And the biggest difference is that the Moderna vaccine do not, does not have to be stored in extremely cold temperatures. Just a regular freezer will be enough for the Moderna vaccine, which would make it more accessible for smaller community clinics and in rural areas. Um, both need to require two doses, the Pfizer three weeks apart and the Moderna four right. weeks apart. And shipments of the Moderna vaccine could happen very quickly in order for them to arrive by the first part of next week to facilities. Right. Health officials say because of the limited supply of vaccines, there will not be any for the general public until around March or April of next right. year. So unfortunately, infections will continue and many Americans will continue to face the harsh realities of illness and financial strain. Right, Elizabeth, but that's how, you know, the government is tackling the situation on the medical front. Let's also look at the economic front. Unemployment has, of course, been soaring high during the pandemic in the United States. In the United States, now, does the U.S. government have a plan on relieving some of the financial burdens of those without jobs at the moment, especially during the holiday season? That's right, and lawmakers are working on it as we speak. In Congress, they're trying to finalize a nine billion dollar corona relief package. They are signaling that they may be working into the weekend to iron out disagreements. Differences between Republicans and Democrats include who is eligible for stimulus checks, how to spend the money for health care, disaster relief funds, and winding down other emergency lending programs. What is expected out of this relief package could be roughly around $600 worth of payments to Americans and unemployment benefits, financial help for small businesses, as well as money for vaccine distribution and schools. Negotiators say they are close, but they may need a short-term resolution to avoid a government shutdown today by midnight. That could help Congress uh, continue to work through the weekend. So all this comes at a time when the number of people out of work, as you mentioned, has been increasing. Um, economists are concerned that the combination of business closures due to the lockdowns, weakening retail spending, employers laying workers off, not good sign for the American mm. economy, unfortunately. Yeah, I was hoping that uh, in the coming year, things only get better, not just for the United States, but for the entire world. Having said that, thank you so much, Elizabeth Lee, for bringing in your precious inputs. Beyond is now available in your country. Download the app now. Get all the news on the move.